my name is Indy Subramanian. I'm at UCLA um, in Los Angeles, and it's my pleasure to uh, have uh, Ray Dorsey on our program today. Um, Ray is a professor of neurology at the University of Rochester and has been doing some amazing advocacy work in largely the space of trying to end Parkinson's disease. Thanks very much for having me, Andrew. Delighted to be with you. So I wanted to first highlight um, some of the work that has really come out and has gotten a lot of media attention around uh, Camp Lejeune and uh, specifically trichloroethylene being as a cause of Parkinson's disease, one of the environmental toxins that we talk about as something that is in pretty much everywhere. Um, and this paper that came out and you wrote a commentary in JAMA Neurology as well. So perhaps we can maybe just summarize the paper and its findings. Sure. So like, if you're like most people uh, and like me, I didn't know what trichloroethylene was until about five or six years ago. So trichloroethylene is a very, very simple uh, molecule. It's got six atoms, two carbon atoms, one hydrogen and white, and three chlorine atoms, hence its name trichloroethylene. There's a very, very, very similar chemical called perchloroethylene, widely used in dry cleaning, and it's got one additional chlorine atom, and per just a prefix meaning um, uh, for. I'll, I'll talk about trichloroethylene predominantly, but uh, there, these, both these chemicals likely have similar toxicity with respect to Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, research done by Dr. Carly Tanner and Sam Goldman uh, about a decade ago showed that in twins who had were exposed to this through either their work, it's widely used as a degreasing agent, or hobbies, it's used in printing and painting, varnish workers, um, uh, anyone that needs it as a solvent, uh, had a 500% increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And importantly, in that study, they showed that there was a lag time between 10 to 40 years between exposure to that chemical and the develop diagnosis of the disease. And because TC was so widely used, uh, they said that public health implications uh, could be substantial. Um, now, what's Camp Lejeune? So Camp Lejeune is a Marine base in North Carolina uh, where many Marines are trained. And between 1953 and 1987, the Marine base, the drinking water was contaminated with uh, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, and uh, other toxic chemicals. And the reason Camp Lejeune is so infamous is because the Marines knew about uh, the contamination for many years and covered it up. Indeed, this story only came to the forefront because the daughter of a Marine drill instructor, her name was Janie In Insminger, uh, developed leukemia at age six, died at age nine, and her father, Jerry Insminger, a retired master sergeant, uh, found out after the fact that these cancer-causing chemicals, TCE, a known carcinogen um, were found at the marine base and could have been an ex explanation for why his uh, daughter developed and died from leukemia. Dr. Sam Goldman and Carly Tanner and Carly and colleagues from UCSF looked at the rates of Parkinson's disease among Marines who served at Camp Lejeune during the 1970s and compared that to the Marines who served near you in Camp Pendleton on the West Coast. Um, and it turned out the Marines who served at Camp Lejeune had a 70% higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease than the Marines who served at Camp uh, Pendleton. Importantly, these Marines, by definition, were healthy. Um, they were young. They were only 20 years old on average when they were at, uh, at Camp Lejeune. And you only stayed at a Marine base for a short period of time. So on average, they were only there for two years. Yet 30 years later, they had a 70% increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Wow. That's pretty profound. You've done a lot of work. And in fact, you wrote a book about um, ending Parkinson's disease along with some of our colleagues. Um, and I read that book uh, when it came out a couple of years ago, and I was really struck by a few things. Parkinson's has doubled in the last 40 years and going to double again in the next 20 years. Can you tell me a little bit about that statistic and also why that is? It's, it's not just because people are aging. Um, what, what is the sense of that? How do we interpret that? Yeah, so according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, which I was fortunate to be part of, um, the number of people with Parkinson's disease has more than doubled in the last 25 years. And just conservative projections based on aging alone suggest it's going to double again unless we change something about it. And it's now the world's fastest growing brain disease. It's growing faster than can be explained by aging alone. And if you look at the map of, uh, of Parkinson's disease, if you just thought it was purely genetic, you would just have a relatively uniform a map of rates of Parkinson's disease, but in fact, we don't see that. Rates of Parkinson's disease are five times higher in industrialized parts of the world, like the United States and Canada, 
than they are in sub-Saharan Africa. And rates of Parkinson's disease are increasing most rapidly in areas of the world that are ongoing, undergoing the most rapid industrialization, such as India and China, where adjusted for age, the rates of Parkinson's disease have more than doubled in the last 25 years. The thesis of our book is that much of this uh, Parkinson's disease is, is man-made. Uh, work done by your colleagues at UCLA, including Jeff Bronstein and Yada Ritz, uh, have de demonstrated that air pollution and certain pesticides are likely fueling the rise of uh, Parkinson's disease. And I, I think given the United States that uh, rates of Parkinson's disease are actually higher in urban and suburban areas than they are in rural areas, I think this dry cleaning chemical, which is, was widely used in the 1970s, everything from typewriter correction fluid to decaffeinated coffee had it, two pounds per American in the 1970s. Uh, it could be one of the most important causes or contributing factors uh, to Parkinson's. So for the general neurologists or practitioners out there that are watching this, um, what can they do? What What is something, you know, if you have a patient that you suspect may have been um, exposed to toxins, um, what, what should we tell our patients or people that aren't patients yet that are at risk? What, what are some things that you, you think would be helpful? So I think one of the things, you know, one of the shortcomings of American medicine is that we often just go from diagnosis to treatment. You're depressed, you get an antidepressant. You're Parkinson's, you get levodopa. You have seizures, you get uh, put on an anti-epileptic medication. I think we need to spend a couple minutes, at least maybe at the beginning, to go to diagnosis of condition. Why do you have this disease? And if you just do a brief, uh, you know, occupational history, you just after I start all my exam things by finding out what people do for a living or did for a living or how they spend their time, I think you'll find a lot of these risk factors uh, are actually present. It's pretty easy to identify if people grew up in a rural area, drank well water, which is prone to be contaminated with pesticides. And we know that people who drink well water have about a 75% increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So I think you can find uh, for people, especially when they grew up when they were young, because it might be the most relevant exposure might be that when uh, people were young children. Um, a little bit harder to get uh, exposure to this. Um, you know, the Marines at Camp Lejeune obviously didn't know they were drinking the water that was contaminated with this and only found out about it after the fact and only found out about it because Jerry Insminger uh, launched a 26-year campaign to bring justice for the Marines uh, and their dependents. But some people will know that they worked with chemicals or with solvents, um, and so they might uh, know about this. In New York City, um, these chemicals are widely used in dry cleaning. They're readily volatile, hence their use in dry cleaning. Um, these chemicals can evaporate from dry cleaning buildings and go into the indoor air of apartments above dry cleaners, for example, in New York City, and they can be in toxic levels. These things are really dissolved in fat, and hence they're used in degreasing. And so there have been studies, for example, in Germany that found that simply supermarkets that are simply near a dry cleaner will have TCE or perchloroethylene and the butter and the cheese that they're selling in the supermarkets. Um, it gets even worse. Um, uh, you know, you bring your daughter into the dry cleaners and that she's eating an ice cream cone. When she leaves that dry cleaner, she's uh, eating uh, perchloroethylene and uh, perhaps trichloroethylene. Um, so it's a little bit harder to find it, but I think it's relevant because uh, some people might be still being exposed. Some people might still be drinking well water and they rarely have their well tested. So for those people, I recommend they get their well tested. And I recommend all my patients to get a carbon filter to decrease exposure um, to pesticides and, and chemicals. A carbon filter is just like what Brita and Pure and other uh, brands are. Um, because this chemical is known to cause cancer, uh, I get a little bit concerned about uh, cancer screening. Uh, this is most strongly tied to the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver cancer, and renal cancer, also linked to multiple myeloma, prostate cancer, likely brain cancer, likely uh, breast cancer, especially in men. Um, so I tell people to be uh, concerned about those. And then I tell people to avoid pesticides if they have Parkinson's disease in all its forms, not only uh, in your drinking water, but in the produce you uh, buy and the food you eat, uh, what you put on your lawn, what you, uh, what's on the golf courses where you play, uh, and the like. I would say just from the wellness perspective, if people are at risk for um, degenerative disease um, in terms of their brain health, things like, you know, um, sleep, mind body practices, um, exercise, you know, and uh, diet, Mediterranean, it sounds like organic, if you can, avoiding um, pesticides and things like that um, are, are all important. And then social connection as well, the things that we think are helpful in general as people age and uh, to prevent, you know, Alzheimer's and other things like that.
Yeah, I mean, I think these are fantastic ways to modify disease course, and these are, you know, and the evidence for them is only increasing. Um, it's also the analogy I like to use, you know, someone's diagnosed with lung cancer, you know, the first thing we tell them to do is to stop smoking. If someone's diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, we don't tell them to stop getting exposure to pesticides. We don't tell them to stop uh, dry cleaning their clothes. We're not telling, we don't tell them to avoid uh, air pollution. These are all risk factors that are increasingly well established for Parkinson's disease. And I think Parkinson's disease fundamentally for the vast majority of people is an entirely preventable disease. Um, and we're not taking actions to prevent people from getting this very disabling and very deadly disease. You and I are quite interested in the sense of being advocates as neurologists. And I think it really fuels our passion and helps us to wake up every morning feeling like we have something uh, that is meaningful and purposeful in our lives. Could you describe this um, as your passion and how it may prevent burnout and, and sort of what it's given you as a neurologist? Yeah, so the credit for a lot of this is, uh, it's Dr. Carly Tanner at UC San Francisco. And I had the gift of sabbatical and she, and I started reading the literature. I started reading her literature and I was, came away that over the last 25 years, she's de detailed these environmental risk factors that are linked to Parkinson's disease, pesticides, these dry cleaning chemicals uh, and air pollution. Um, and when I read it, I just realized that this was the case. At the same time I was reading her work, um, I read this book called, um, how to Survive a Plague uh, by, Dr. by David France, who uh, was a member of a group called ACT UP, a uh, member of uh, men in New York City who reacted to the emergence of HIV in the 1980s. And if you remember the 1980s, you know, uh, there was no federal response uh, to HIV. People were blamed for the diseases that they were uh, developing. And it was only because brave uh, men and women in New York City and in San Francisco banded together and organized uh, that they changed the course of HIV. And they didn't just do it for themselves, right? They did it for all of us. You and I and many people listening um, may not have HIV because of their courage. And they made a HIV a treatable condition. It's actually more treatable than Parkinson's disease. It's associated with a near normal life expectancy. They also made it a preventable disease. You know, thousands, if not millions of us don't have HIV because of their work. And it's an increasingly less common disease. Rates of HIV are actually decreasing. I mean, something that you or I would never have expected when we were in, in medical training. And I can't think of a better uh, outcome for a neurologist or any physician is to make the diseases that they're caring for non-existent. And we lived in a world that didn't have HIV. We lived in a world that where uh, lung cancer largely didn't exist. We've lived in a world uh, in that we've had worlds in the past where Parkinson's disease likely didn't exist or existed in extremely uh, small numbers say might be true for diffuse Lewy body disease and others. And if these diseases are preventable, we can take actions uh, as individuals, as a society to lower our risk. And what a wonderful gift for future generations uh, and many generations to come, hopefully, uh, to live in a world that's largely devoid of Parkinson's disease. Just like we live in a world free of typhus, we live in a world free of smallpox, we live in a world where polio is extraordinarily uncommon. We don't even have treatments for polio because we just don't have polio. And I think we can do the same thing uh, for Parkinson's for the vast majority. Well, thank you so much, Ray, for your advocacy. We're kind of getting to the point in neurology, which is exciting to me of possibly primary prevention, even of some of these disorders. And so, um, you know, I think we have a role in that, which is exciting for the future. Absolutely.